man, that worship was great. Laura, Kevin, thank you, man. That was awesome. Um, for those of you guys that don't know, my name is Mike Sunbury. I'm the worship director here at Ignite Church, um, and I have been given the privilege to speak to you guys today. It is so strange, um, if I can be totally honest, preaching to a, a phone or a camera. So this is a little crazy. But, you know, God calls us out of our comfort zone, so I'm so excited today. The message I have for you is called Shake Up the Ground. And if you heard the last song, it says, shake up the ground of all my traditions and break down the wall of all my religion. That song has been so hard on my heart over the last couple of days, really the last couple of weeks. Um, so I called it Shake Up the Ground because that song says, shake up the ground of all my traditions. So today we're going to actually be talking about traditions. Um, in this series of this order, you know, we were talking last week about how we miss our original settings and we need to go back to our original settings. And sometimes traditions actually cause us to come out of our original settings, come out of the way God originally intended us to be. Um, so right here, I have the definition of tradition. So what is tradition? Tradition is the transmission of customs or beliefs from generation to generation, or the fact of being passed on in this way. So the thing I really want to focus on here is generation to generation. How many of you guys have like traditions that you do with your family? So one thing that I can think of that almost all of us have is on the 4th of July, we have a tradition to go watch fireworks. Um, personally, I don't think I've ever asked why we go see fireworks on the 4th of July. We just do it. And when you think about it, we all go do the fireworks on the 4th of July, and most of us probably don't even know why. We just do it because it's a tradition. And the reason why is because our, our parents did it. Our parents brought us to go see the fireworks. And the reason they bring us to see the fireworks is typically because their parents brought them to bring the fireworks, and their parents, and so on. So for generations... Our parents have been bringing us to go see fireworks. So now it's just second nature. On the 4th of July, we have a barbecue, and we go see fireworks. But when it first started, there was a why. There was a reason why the fireworks were so important. And over time, as the tradition got passed down, the why got lost. And I feel like we've gotten to that place as a church where traditions of how the church is supposed to function have gotten passed down and we've completely lost the why. So it's super important for us not to lose the why. Like that's the whole meaning behind the tradition. Otherwise it's just action. And what, I mean action without anything behind it is just, it's pointless. So the first scripture I want to go into today is in Isaiah. So first, the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah actually is a foreshadowing of everything that's going to be happening in Jesus' life. Um, what the Savior is going to bring, what's going to happen with the kingdom of God afterwards. So although Isaiah is in the Old Testament, it is actually explaining to us what's going to be. Isaiah is the prophecy that Jesus is pretty much fulfilling. So here it says forget all that. So let me explain what that means. The verse before this, God is talking about the miracles that he's done the thing that he's gotten his people out of. So last month we were talking about Moses and how Moses freed the Israelites. So after Pharaoh finally gave in, after God brought, you know, all these plagues and, and this craziness, Pharaoh finally said, okay, cool, you can let my people go. After that, Moses brings the people through, whatever, he gets to the Red Sea and God does this awesome miracle of parting the Red Sea. During this time, Pharaoh's like, you know what? I take it back. You can't let my people go. And sends his army to go get them. So the scripture before this is talking about how he stopped the army. So after the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, that army was in the Red Sea and God just collapsed it on them and took out the army that was trying to come against his people. So here it's saying, forget all that. Forget all the, the craziness, the epicness that I've done. You think about Joshua. He told Joshua to go take this land of Jericho that had these high walls and just told him to walk around seven times. They walk around seven times, the walls come tumbling down. Like, these are crazy miracles, and God is saying, forget all of that. That is nothing 
compared to what I'm going to do. So I don't know about you guys, but parting an entire sea is quite epic to me. I don't think I've ever seen that before. I don't think I've had the ability to do it. I mean, it doesn't, like, it doesn't, I can't, you ever watch Bruce Almighty when he sits there with his hands and he parts the soup? I haven't even gotten that far. So as far as parting a sea, that's pretty epic to me. Taking down walls without even touching the walls, they just circled the walls with worship. And then the walls came down. Like, I've never seen that before. So that's pretty epic. But God is saying that's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. So can you just imagine what he's going to do, right? All, our imagination goes wild. So here he goes. For I'm about to do something new. He's about to break tradition and give us something new. He says, see, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. He's saying, I'm going to make a way where there is no way. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland, which means when you feel like you're lost, when you feel like you're in a barren land, he's going to provide what you need to keep you going. The wild animals in the fields will thank me, the jackals and owls too, for giving them water in the desert. Yes, I will make the rivers in the dry wasteland so my chosen people can be refreshed. Now, I don't know about you. I'm going to say this word a lot, traditionally, because it just, it fits. Traditionally, forests and wilderness, they don't necessarily have paths. They're just a bunch of trees. And the animals kind of just do what they got to do. And God is saying, yes, traditionally, that doesn't have a path. But I'm going to do something new. And I'm going to make a path, which means I'm going to shift your thought on what a wilderness was supposed to be. So although you think that you're in the wilderness, traditionally, yes, you'd be lost. But I'm going to make this path. I'm going to break that tradition for years and years that a forest has had no path. I'm going to break that and make a way. And a wasteland, a desert. I don't know of many deserts that have flowing rivers. Um, yeah, I just don't know of any. I'm trying to think of any. And I don't have any. I probably should have opened this before. Sorry. But I don't know of any dry wastelands, deserts that have flowing rivers. So God is saying traditionally, they don't have rivers. There's nothing for you to drink from. But what I'm about to do, see, tradition is another word for in the box. A wasteland has no rivers, says the box. But my God works outside of the box. He broke tradition and said, what I'm about to do is far greater. I'm going to create rivers. He's saying that all those miracles that he did, what's better than that? What is he about to do that's greater? He's about to break tradition. He's about to break the have-to mindset on the way things are supposed to be. That's going to be far greater. That's a game changer, guys. That's a game changer for the way that we reach the lost. That's a game changer for the way that we see ourselves and our situations. Traditionally, it, we're lost. But there's a way. And God broke that tradition saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose my people over what everybody says should be. So I was looking at it, and I'm actually go back to this generation to generation, this definition of tradition again, transmission of customs or belief from generation to generation. I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking about it, and I'm like, man. So technically, generational curses are a tradition. It is saying that because my father had this problem and his father had this problem and their father had this problem, so should I. Now, growing up, I did not have my father around. Me and my father now have an amazing relationship. I love my dad to death. Um, but growing up, things happen and, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily in my life. And my mom she grew up without a very present father, so on and so forth. So traditionally, tradition says I should be absent from my child's life. But God broke that tradition into saying, no, I'm going to work through you and start something new. There's going to be something new here. Now, I have, for those of you guys that know, I have a three-year-old daughter, and we just found out that I have a son on the way. So I'm so excited about that. But I am not going to allow tradition 
to change the direction that I'm headed. So tradition says I shouldn't be around for my child. Tradition says, based off my family history, tradition says I should be a drug addict. Tradition says I should be an alcoholic. But I'm not going to allow tradition to define the steps that I take to move forward. I'm not going to allow tradition the, the, the joy of directing my life. Because at the cross, tradition was broken. Those curses were broken. I don't have to live based off of what tradition says anymore. And we find ourselves in that box, even in worship. How often do we turn off the idea of certain styles of worship when in reality, you're just putting worship in a box? And we try so hard. We try so Man, the dancing, people get judged for dancing during worship. And I'm like, that's it. That's, that's just their worship, dude. It's, it's out of the box. Let it be out of the box. Um, one thing that, I, like, I, I was kind of like teaching some of the worship leaders on the team about spontaneous worship and, and prophetic worship and, and what it means to lead a spirit-led worship set. Um, Because that's something that I wasn't able to do for a while. And I gradually surrounding myself with certain people was able to kind of tap into that and understand what it meant. And what what I was afraid of is I didn't want people to think that a spirit-led service had to have spontaneous worship. Or a spirit-led service had to have a crazy prophetic moment. Because then we run the risk of, taking it out of one box and putting it into another. And that's not what we're meant to do at all. We run the risk of taking it out of the typical standard verse, chorus, bridge of the way worship and the builds and the craziness and like, okay, but it has to have a spontaneous moment. So in our attempt to take it out of the box and to break the tradition of what people see worship as, we actually put it in another box ourselves. And that's not what we're here for. We're here to take it out of the box and keep it out of the box. Like, God is out of the box, dude. God doesn't, he's so far outside the box, the box is a dot to him. Like, we can't try and take, I, I was talking with my wife, you know, the, the traditions and stuff should be methods, not guidelines. They shouldn't be have-tos. They should just be ways, avenues of, of making it happen. And we take tradition, we take this box of tradition, and we try and put all this kingdom culture and what God is and who he says he is, and we try and fit it into this tiny little box. And God's like, what are you doing? No matter how hard you try or how big you make that box, I promise you what I have for you is not going to fit in there. But we're so bent on making it something we can comprehend and we can relate to that we're losing the essence of the why. We're losing the why. So after the resurrection, you know, I thought this would be a, um, a, a great verse to, to, to move into. It's, it's talking about baptism. And last week was Resurrection Sunday. So the first four books of the Bible, uh, of the New Testament, not the Bible. I'm so sorry. That was terrible. First four books of the New Testament, they're the Gospels. And they're preaching and, and, and teaching on the life of Jesus as he lived up to his death and resurrection. After those four Gospels is a book called Acts or Acts of the Apostles. This is the book that explains everything that happens post-resurrection. This happens after the resurrection of Jesus. So it brings us to right here. Acts 1, 4 through 5, says, While being together and eating with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. So remember, back in Isaiah, he's promising something new. God is saying he's bringing something new. So Isaiah is that foreshadow of everything that happened with Jesus. So he's bringing something new. So they're going to wait here for what the Father had promised. He promised that something new. Of which he said, you have heard me speak. For John baptized with water. John the Baptist, he baptized people with water. But you will be baptized and empowered and united with the Holy Spirit not long from now. So that brings us to that day of Pentecost. So the day of Pentecost, the disciples went up into what's called the upper room. We we talk about the upper room experience. And they just went after God. And they waited there 
until they experienced what the Father had promised, something new. The way that it was before the death and resurrection was water baptism. Here, this was baptism by the Holy Spirit. So the water, when you get water baptized, right, you go in a tank of water, your pastor or, or whoever it is, your leader, baptizes you. It baptizes the outside. The outside of you gets totally drenched in water. Here, this is saying you're going to not just be baptized, but you're going to be empowered and united with the Holy Spirit. This baptism, God is baptizing the inside of us. Tradition had us being baptized by water on the outside. This had us being baptized by fire on the inside, lighting a fire within us that's going to burn forever and ever. Like, God, we're just going after you. So tradition broke literally days after the resurrection. When the resurrection happened, Jesus spent time on earth and he was teaching. Like, this was, I think, 50 days. 50 days post-resurrection, boom, this happens. Imagine what can happen now. Well, I was talking to a pastor before, and he said, what, what could happen in 50 days from this quarantine? What if that happens again? We've been talking about a revival, that this thing is going to bring revival. You want to talk about breaking tradition? Look at what we're doing now. This is not tradition, church. Speaking to a camera is not traditionally how you preach. I've not done it before. So preaching to an audience of zero it's not really traditionally how it's done. But we're outside of tradition. We're breaking tradition. We're breaking barriers. And that's what God's trying to do. He's trying to open our minds. He's trying to open our perspective to just being like, guys, don't put me in this box. I don't want to be anywhere near this box. What I have is so much greater than the box. But you're only reaching surface level, box level, because that's all you see me as right now. That's all you see that I can do right now. So, like I said, tradition is a method. It's not a guideline. Like, you, we have um, certain, certain, like, Pentecostal churches, so to speak. The jean skirts and the long hair and everything like that. I'm not saying they're doing anything wrong. They just have a different method than I do. Like, that's it. Tradition, for them, traditionally, that's how you need to be. And I'm wrong. But God stands outside of tradition, so I'm not wrong, but they're not wrong either. They're just doing it different than I am, and that's okay. Guys, the kingdom of God is full of different body parts. No body part functions the same way. No body part moves the same way. My elbow bends one way. My knee bends the other way. Like, if I try to bend my knee the same direction as my elbow, I break my leg. Like, that's okay, and we have to be okay with that. We can't box God into this tradition that he's, you're only saved if you do this, if you look like this, you only have salvation. You can only access God if you look like this, if you act like this. Like, no. If I do 10 push-ups a day, that's how I, I see God. What if I start that tradition now? If I start the tradition, you wake up every morning, 10 push-ups a day, and that's how God comes. Then I pass it down to my child and my grandchild. Bet you 10 generations from now, some church is going to be like, yeah, no, you have to do push-ups to see God. Why? Why? Because I started that. Man started all these traditions. Like, what? Well, who are we to think? I'm looking back at, um, I was looking back at Adam and Eve at the garden. They had this unhindered relationship with God. They walked with God. They spoke audibly with God. They felt God like he was physically there. And then they sinned. They took the, the apple or the pomegranate or whatever fruit you want it to be. They took the bite. And they got banished from the garden. And man, ever since, has been trying to come up with ways to get that access again. When at the cross, we were brought back to the garden. At the cross, the death and resurrection brought our spirits back to the garden. Our physical body is sitting here trying to do all this craziness to get that access again when we have it already. And we're looking at somebody else because they're physically going about it a different way and saying that they're wrong. God doesn't show up to you and not show up to them. Like, God is real for everybody. Aside, it doesn't matter whether you do your 10 push-ups in the morning or you pray in the morning or you work, like, if you worship to Spanish music or to, to English, like, it, it, that doesn't matter. That's not the point behind it. 
So anyway, it's going to bring us to another uh, verse in Acts. We get there. Okay. Acts 13, 4 through 7. It said, For the Lord gave us this command when he said, I have made you a light to the Gentiles to bring salvation to the farthest corners of the earth. So far in the Old Testament and back when Jesus was walking the earth, everybody was so focused on the Jews. So there are Jews and Gentiles in the Bible. The Jews are the people that were following after God. The Gentiles are the people that were not. Back then, everything was so focused on, you're a Jew, you need to act this way. If you're a Jew, you act this way. Stay away from the Gentiles. But at the cross, that changed. Bigly changed huge. It says, you're going to be a light to the Gentiles. So what tradition said we needed to stay away from, God is now saying, this is the whole purpose you're here. This is the whole reason why you are here. So tradition says, stay away from those people. And God's like, but why? You need to be a light to them. A light in a room full of 50 other lights literally does nothing. If I have a room probably this size and I have 50 lights in here and I shut off 40 of them, I doubt you can tell the difference. But if you take a room this size, pitch black, and you turn on one light, it makes all the difference. Our job is not to gather with with, with people that believe the same thing all the time. That's good because that's how you encourage each other. That's how you stay lifted up. But we say our, our slogan is um, we gather on Sunday to deploy on Monday. If you're just gathering on Sunday, you're missing the point. If you're just gathering on Sunday, you're with a whole bunch of other lights. But when you deploy on Monday, when you break that tradition, you become the light to the lost. The real reason we are put here, the whole purpose of being here is to be that light. Ooh. So I, I just got this verse before, so it's not up here and I'm so sorry. It's Matthew 15, three through six. This is the New Living Translation version. It says, Jesus replied, why do you by your traditions violate the direct commandments of God? I'm going to say that one more time. Why do you, by your traditions, violate the direct commandments of God? Then it says, for instance, God says, honor your father and mother, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. But you say, it is all right for the people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you, for I have vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. And the amplified version, it, it, it actually... Uh, uh, makes it a little bit more clear, talking about money and resources. So God is also saying, if your parents need money, don't give the money to me. Give it to them. So everybody wants to paint this huge picture that churches are all after the money and whatever, but this is, this is like, Scripture is saying, if there is somebody who way of loving other people, you're violating the commandment right there. Like, but it's so simple. It's, it is right there. Like, it's our job to spread the culture, the kingdom culture, not spread traditions. Traditions are within our culture. Like they're methods. They're just methods. They're not guidelines. It's the have to mentality that we just have to get rid of. The have to that we have to. Like it's the have to's that are the problem. So this brings me to, oh, wow, it, my last thing. So this isn't a scripture. This is my last point here. I'm going to wrap up. Elevation Worship just came out with a new song. Um, it's called Rattle. So I, when we did the live one Saturday, um, I had, you know, said that God speaks to me a lot through worship. He speaks to a lot of people through worship. But like, for me, lyrics really stand out. I saw this lyric and almost fell over on my couch. It says, just ask the stone that was rolled at the tomb in the garden, what happens when God says to move? I was dumbfounded. It's like, first of all, who put those lyrics together? Call me. Second of all, what happens, just ask the stone, what happens when God says to move? I don't know about you. 
Traditionally, when somebody dies, they don't usually come back to life three days later. In biblical times, when they crucified them, I haven't seen any other records of somebody walking out of the tomb. So that right there is like, that was the first thing he broke, that tradition, right? That the first thing he did was break a tradition. Just ask that stone what happened. When I get to heaven, I hope the stone speaks because the Bible says the rocks cry out. So I hope it speaks because this is going to be the first question I ask now. What, what happened? When God said move, what happened? What did you feel that you just rolled? You just rolled out of the way. And there's another one that was talking about asking the dry bones what happened when God said rise. Like when God is commanding something, what happens? God is commanding us to move out of the box of traditions, out of the box of the have tos. God is saying, guys, it's this box over here is nice and all, but you can only do so much in here. I can only do so much in here through you. If you just step out and you come into my bigger picture, the bigger picture of everything that I have, I promise you, not only will you not be the same, but you're going to see a generation that will never be the same. This generation is going to go down in the history books. Traditionally, um, Pastor George says this all the time, the, the Northeast coast is considered the frozen chosen saying that our hearts are cold and, and, and God will never be able to do something up here, traditionally. And I believe that through this time, this quarantine, this time of seeking after God, this time of getting close and being intimate with God, we're going to wake up to something new. What happens in 50 days from that quarantine? I don't think we've reached the 50 days yet, right? No? Okay. We haven't reached the 50 days yet. So just... Let's think about it. What happens? What can happen? What revival can happen that breaks tradition? What walls that you've surrounded yourself or your church or your worship in are going to come down? God is saying move. It's time to move out of that box and in to my plan, my bigger picture. So... Right now, I just want to pray for everybody that's watching because I know I'm not the only one who finds the box comfortable. Um, the box is something you're used to. The box is something that some of you grew up in. Some of you guys, the box is the only thing you were ever exposed to, and that's why you found comfort in it. And every day, we have to find the courage to step out of our box, to step out of our tradition, to create new habits, to create new mentalities, new perspectives. So right now, I just want to pray for everybody listening. You know, if that's you, um, you could either put a wave in the comments or you don't have to do anything. We have our prayer team standing by. They're going to be praying for you guys all week um, and so on. And I, I'm going to go on the comments too after this, and I'm going to see who, who needs prayer as well, because this is something that has really, once I was told that I, that, um, I was going to be preaching today that song, Shake Up the Ground of All My Traditions. It's called Make Room by Community Music. So if you want to go ahead and listen to that, that song has been just playing over and over in my head. And I just knew right away, God was like, I'm doing something new and my people need to know about it. So right now, God, as we are all gathered here virtually, God, we're gathered here together in one spirit. And I just pray for any individual that's on here that is feeling boxed in, that is feeling cornered in their ways of tradition, in their ways of thinking. God, I just pray that you break that right now. I pray uh, an overabundance of courage to step out of our com comfort zone. I pray peace as we step out of our comfort zone, that God, we, we're not afraid 
of what might come out here. We're not afraid that we're going in the wrong direction. God, we just be guided totally by you. Let us just continue to follow after you and chase after you, my God, and continue to break down those walls, to shake up the ground of our foundation. Because that's how you test the true strength of a building. Of when, when you're building something, you have to shake up that foundation. And that's going to tell you how strong that building is, how many storms that thing will be able to last. So God, shake up our foundation of anything that is loose. Shake up our foundation of anything that's not sturdy and fill it with you. Fill it with strength, courage, peace, and love, my God. I pray this in your name. Amen. So guys, I thank you all for tuning in. Um, it was truly awesome being able to share the word with you guys. Uh, do not forget just a couple announcements before we head off. Tuesday and Friday this week, we have our checkpoints that are going to be on. It's going to give you a recap of everything that's been going on. Um, updates on stuff that we're going to be doing, events that we're going to be doing uh, virtually for now. I'm really hoping that we can get back in here. Um, Pastor Ed and Pastor Alice were talking about it yesterday on their live. Y'all don't understand. When we get back here, it's going to be wild. Like, I'm ready. I'm ready for that new thing to come down in here. I'm ready. So, um, and then on Thursday, we have the pit. You definitely don't want to miss the pit. It is about an hour of just worship, seeking after God, going after God, uh, completely unhindered. There's no agenda. There's been times where we sat here for about five, ten minutes and just let Kev play the piano. Man, this guy's got a gift. And he starts playing, and I, I genuinely feel the spirit moving through just the piano. You know, tradition says it has to be through vocals or something, but that's not the way God works. So he works through everything. So, and then Saturday... Six o'clock, while we're going live, we have our, let's talk about it. So guys, do not miss it. The next Sunday, we'll see you guys back here again at 11 o'clock. Guys, I love you guys. Be blessed and have an awesome Sunday. Thank you for joining us. So excited you could spend time with us. If you was encouraged, built up, or edified by this message, and you want to hear more, then subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook and Instagram, and also Share this page. You know someone can hear a message of hope at this moment in this time. And for those who help us financially, we thank you. We love you for all you do because of what you do for this ministry we can do for the world. Thank you so much. And to the next one.